Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. Hey, hey, welcome to your day off. My name is Corey, and of course, I'm sitting with my best friend, Tony. What's up, man? Man, I'm glad to be your best friend three days in a row. Three days in a row, man. I haven't traded you in. You know, we'll, Not yet. we'll, we'll see what happens in an hour, but as of right now, I haven't traded you in. I have a feeling I might be traded in today. I, hey, listen, you know, if you deserve it, you deserve it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, so once again, you'll hear that noise in the background. We are sitting at the Salt Lake City Beauty and Barber Expo. A big shout out to our main man, Tyler Kelbert, for uh, inviting us in and for allowing us to set up here. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, listen, if you're in the mountain time zone or if you're within driving distance of the Salt Lake City Barber, Barber, Beauty and Barber, why do I mess it up every time? It's the BB, <laughs> the Beauty and Barber Expo. You know, you definitely um, when this thing happens next October, you have to get in here. It's and like I said last pa- podcast, yep. you got to stay a couple extra days either before or after because the sightseeing around here is spectacular. Yeah, you do. We've spent our fair n- a number of days in, you know, between the last few years in, in Utah, and there's never been a day that was disappointing in Utah because it's just gorgeous. And know? pictures and, you know, none of that can describe. You have to be here to experience it. Yeah, it is an experience place. It is not a picture place. No. You know? Like, even the best photographers in the world can't c- capture the feelings that you have. It's, it's almost like... It's like a yin and yang, right? Like, it's, like, so beautiful and so big. And, like, for me, I feel like I'm a part of something bigger, but also, like, insignificant at the same time, which is this really weird feeling that, that the sights give you, you know. But, but yeah, that's crazy. So um, I'm excited about our, our chat today. We, uh, we, have, we have a champion, I think. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We have a ch- it's funny because you know, even in the pre-talk, when you talk to someone, it's like, yeah, I, I, I get it. I see why. Yeah, 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 for real. You know what I mean? Just, just, just a cool, cool, just – a cool persona, cat. you know what I mean? Yeah, it's so inviting. It's just, I get it. I get it. I totally get it. And the height, and, and also, so um, you know, we we are very fortunate where you know we're friends with a, a couple other honorees that he just was awarded. So our guest today is Roderick San, San Samuels. 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 Roderick Samuels and uh, Roderick won the Naha Educator of the Year this past year, and of course Sam won it a couple years ago, and I think John won it. I think the year before. Yeah, for um, so sure. It's it's. It, it, it's amazing that, you know, our friendships are, are picking, the, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me because we want to elevate the people that are making a difference. So it doesn't surprise me, you know? Yeah, and, and that's, one of my, that's one of my questions uh, for him was. Okay, we'll get in there. Yeah. Shall we get in? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Mr. Roderick Samuels, welcome to your day off. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a great day here at the Salt Lake City Beauty and Barber Expo, and uh, just really, really elated that you guys invited me onto this show. Of course. This, this, is, this is one of the best seats, by the way. Um, there's tons and tons of podcasts out there, whatever the case may be, but you guys are doing it right, so I want to give you your flowers while you can smell them, for sure. Oh, thank you, uh, man. We I thought you were just that. showing him up, because you made it sound so easy when you said the Salt Lake City Beauty <laughs> and Barber Expo. He was uh, showing me up. <laughs> well, you know, I, <laughs> I actually moisturized my lips before I said anything like that, so Corey Fair. might just need a little chapstick, you know what I'm saying? We'll get him a little, get him a little uh, petroleum jelly. So it's all it, hidden so, behind so, this beard. Well, got to mix him with nouns and everything. The, the, the enunciation is, is proper. Right. You got to lick your lips first. Uh-huh. Lick the lips you'll first. Fi- you'll the find our podcast, we don't have that a whole lot. Well, <laughs> no. you know what? We need to find you a chapstick spot. <laughs> <somewhere. laughs> Ch- you, hey, chapstick. Yes. If you're listening in, yes. you know, we, yes. we, we need a chapstick hey. uh, sponsor. For sure. So, Roger, where are you from, bro? Um, originally, I am from Somerville, South Carolina, which is about 15 miles outside of Charleston, South Carolina. So, uh, grew up in the South. Uh, you guys can probably notice with man the the no sir the yes ma'ams the all that other stuff but um but just you know making sure that you know in the south we always have a little bit more empathy in my you know in my opinion of course sure but uh southerners teen, uh southerners tend to be a little bit more empathetic a little bit more warm and a little bit more open about you know just things that's going on and just being inviting to people coming into our homes and in my case in our in our into our industry i've been mm. to charleston once did you like it 
Uh, yeah, we liked it a lot. What part of Charleston did you go to, if you remember? We went to uh, Wrightsville Beach. Okay. I mean, no, not Wrightsville, but Isle of Palm. Uh, IOP. Yeah. yeah. So we went to Isle of Palm, and then we did a day over uh, to Charleston. Okay. We did the horse and buggy tour yep, and all do that. that. Gotta do we that. Did, uh, uh, we did a, a, a bay tour on the kayaks. Okay. We saw the bird sanctuaries yep. and stuff like that. Just the whole thing, the whole experience was and everybody was super friendly. Everybody was super nice, and it was just my wife's like, "Oh, I can see myself living down so here." So Tony, listen. So you, you you went to the Isle of Palms. You you did all of that stuff. Did you surf? Surf? I did not surf. Did you swim? Yes. Okay. How far in the water did you go? Uh, not far. I okay. mean. All right, don't go to Charleston again, okay? Dude, you just <laughs> messed up our whole city. Based on <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even have a prawn, man. You right. got to surf. You got you to gotta get some salt water in, in your lungs. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's just disrespectful to the South. The South uh, I'm just I apologize. No, I'm just oh, well, you. we're north of the Mason Dick. No, we're south of the Mason Dixon, north of the... Whatever the Civil War line is. Yeah, right? for we sure. went to, You know where Fripp Island is? I do. I'm very familiar with it. Yeah, so we went there after a uh, hurricane, and <laughs> uh, and you know, not 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 thinking, but like half the houses were boarded up. It was like debris all over the beach. Right. It's like, oh man, you at felt least it wasn't your timeshare. You yeah, <laughs> there's well, that. Then my wife said, "Yeah, I don't know if I want to live down here." <laughs> you know, living living on the coast. Um, so I moved from South Carolina to the Midwest, and you talk about a. A culture shock, but also like weather-wise, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, normally in the South, when it snows, we don't go to school. The, the roads shut down and everything. So my first year of living in Michigan, it started to snow, it and <laughs> my kids were getting up to go to school. I'm like, "What the hell are y'all doing getting up to school?" It's like, "Oh, we got to go to school." I was like, "No, it's snowing outside." It's like, "Oh yeah, we still go to school." I was like, "Damn!" In in the snow and all of the elements, and just not my jam. But Roderick, but, a couple of years ago, we were in Montana. <laughs> and and when we were in Montana, like it snowed, like blizzard snowed all night long, sure. and, I, and we and we actually walked over to, anyways, it didn't matter. We were walking the streets, and like I thought for sure, like we'd be the only ones walking out, and that there'd be there'd be no uh, cars out. It was packed. Wow. I mean, it was Bozeman. It was Bozeman back, sure. but it was still packed with like cars. And I'm like, this would have shut us down. Yeah. You know, it's like no mind. I guess you can't mind if it's always there. No, you know, and and I think that's one of the. And things by the way, like, no plows. Okay. Right, they were just like in their four wheel drive. Everyone's in a Subaru. <laughs> they yeah. were just moving on. You know, I, I, I think that's still one of my biggest fears is driving in snow. Mm-hmm. I cannot. I, I can. I can surf during a hurricane, but I can't drive in snow. It's yeah. Yeah, I, I just can't do it. I and all your different. neighbors are glad you're not driving in <laughs> snow as well. Uh, <laughs> yes, they are. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Because the difference is, is that you know we're uh, we live right outside of D.C. Okay. Yeah. For sure. And uh, so we got ice mixed with our snow, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm sure down in the south. But Michigan, it's dry. Or Bo- Bozeman, it was dry. Right. So it's, you know, there's all the moisture. It's just so the snow packs easy to drive on, right? Yeah. But Not my cup of tea. I'll stick to the barbershop. Yeah. <laughs> I feel that, man. How did, speaking of the barbershop, how'd you get in the industry? Um, you know, I got into the industry actually through failure. Um, I was a very, very highly recruited wrestler uh, coming out of high school. Um, two-time state champ. And, um, of course, you know, <laughs> Being a jock sometimes, you know, my grades didn't amount up with my vision and my, my other goals. So um, I went to college for about two years, not to wrestle, but just to make an effort to get my grades up. And uh, my grades were so low, they could reach up to touch bottom. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> my grades made it home before I did. So my mom secretly, and this is the, funny, the funniest th- thing in the world, um, my mom drives up. I didn't even know she was coming, and next thing I know, I hear a knock on my apartment door, like, and I'm like, oh, so, you know, who's here? You know, because I, you know, I was supposed to have a party earlier in the day. Uh, it was my mom. Yep, it was oh. my mom and my dad, and she brought my dad along so he could drive my car back home. So oh. um, I made a lot of good decisions at bad times, <laughs> to, to say the least. But, uh, but, you know, I'd always been cutting hair since I was about 13 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to be the kitchen titian. Uh, the bathroom barber, you know yep. what I'm saying? And uh, I used to be the guy that's putting uh, packs of Kool-Aid in all my friend's hair after using peroxide, hydrogen peroxide to lighten it. So I've always kind of had this thing going on, but never knew that um, utilizing my skills, my my, uh, my 
my passion, uh, my passion for people, but also my creativity would actually even give me an opportunity to do some of the amazing things that I've done so far in my career. So that's kind of how I started, man. So did they just take your car and left, left you there, or did you? Ma- they make you get in the car? And- no, oh, no, 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 Mama, Mama wanted his ear. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that was the shock and awe for Mama. So, um, it was kind of embarrassing to be honest with you. You know, my mom was a public school teacher, master's degree. You know, um, she would never. You know, she'd be like, "Don't you be embarrassing me in front of all these folk." making all these badass grades and I'm like I'm just trying to do the best that I can mom <laughs> you know but uh but no she she made me finish up my semester um but I, I didn't have any transportation so that kind of you know my dad used to always say um a man walking ain't going far right. and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um and then you know insult to injury as my dad is leaving the college campus he said hey he, you know he pulls by me I'm sitting out there looking like a sad puppy and he rolls down the window and he says hey do me a favor. I said, yes, sir. What can I do? He was like, go get you a Chevrolet. I said, Chevrolet? He said, yeah, shove your left foot out and lay the right foot <laughs> behind it. And, I was like, and then he pulls a skirt and just merch off. And I was like, you know what? Ain't this about a bitch? <laughs> You're my dad. You're supposed to love me, man. You come in oh, he did love you more than you jokes do. jokes on me and shit. It was weird. But, but I will tell you this. Lesson learned, right? You know? Um, opportunities don't go away to go to somebody else. And I had an amazing mm. opportunity to get um, an education. My parents didn't want me to work, didn't want my sister to work. Go to school, get your education, and make it happen. And I, I completely screwed that up. Um, but unfortunately, you know, had I listened to my dad, who is a, he, my dad was a truck driver for 55 years. He said, listen, go to trade school first. Then if you decide to go to college, you'll have something to fall back on. You know, I did it completely backwards and um, I still came out pretty decent, so shout out to Edward Samuels and, and shout out to my mom, who's passed away now, but rest in peace for giving me that tutelage and um, giving me that tough love when I really, really needed it. Mm, I love that, man. Thank you, man. I love that. So so from, so from did you start barbering school after that semester? No. You know what? So um, I went home for a little bit, and <laughs> I'm going to call it a gap month. Uh, most kids take a gap year after high school to figure out what they want to do. I had literally 30 days. My mom gave me the biggest ultimatum, and, and I'm not talking about the TV show that everybody loves, but uh, <laughs> this was some real shit ultimatum. Like, so you got 30 days to figure it out. Either you're going to go into the military or you got to find something to do because you can't have your black ass around my house like this. And I was like, okay, that's fair, mom. Um, so my sister made a suggestion to me, and, and thank, thank God for our siblings. She said, um, have you ever thought about being a barber? And I'm like, hell no, I ain't thought about being a barber. I wanted to be, I actually went to, check this out, how about this? I actually went to college to become an early childhood education teacher. I wanted to teach kindergarten. Wow. You really want me around your kid, man? <laughs> I mean, not that I'm, I'm not that kind of guy, you know what I'm saying? But I curse and drink a lot, so, you know, you don't, you don't really want me messing with little Junior that much. But, uh, but no, I, I always thought, you know, to myself, like, my mom was a public school teacher for 33 years. She she had, you know, three months off during the summer. She was still getting paid. She would travel or just sit at home and watch soap operas and, 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 and have her cocktails every day. And I just thought to myself, that would be an amazing life after I wrestled in college, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that didn't work out <laughs> at all. But, you know, it's kind of funny how the universe works that, you know, I still got an opportunity to do education, but I just wasn't sure of how or what vehicle that Mm -hmm. education and my passion for sharing with people would come in, it came through barbering. So I just thought that was really, really dope. That's a story that I like to share with a lot of people is that it's not where you're from, it's where you're at. And sometimes instead of focusing on what you're going to do further on in life, live in the moment and let that kind of navigate and steer you to where you need to be. you got to trust something, you know? Mm, Wow. Good words, man. So what took you to Michigan? Man, now you really want to get into it, huh? Um... So, Tony, I'm going to tell you a story, and um, my wife is probably going to, you know, if you ever have her on the show, her story will probably be a little bit different, but um, I'll I'll give you the real version. We can talk about the other version afterwards. So, um, I'd always had a pull to Michigan. It was the Fab Five basketball team back when Chris Webber and all of them were together, and then um, I, uh, I always wanted to wrestle at the University of Michigan because I was a big time wrestler in high school, and you know, just I always thought about going to Michigan. Somehow Michigan and Detroit was always subliminally on my radar. I grew up with 
you know, listening to Motown with my parents, smoking Robinson, and y'all know how it is. You, you got to give Barry Sanders, come on, the greatest <laughs> running back all time, uh, a shout. You, you, I mean, you mean to talk about Emmett Smith. Oh. oh. Uh, yeah, so Barry is great. Uh, <laughs> apparently Barry's all right. I'm not gonna have. I'm not gonna debate you. I'm not gonna debate you. No, look. no. I mean, you know, it's 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 my little red wagon to push a pull, and I promise you, I've had a lot more defeats than I've had victories. <laughs> talking about my love for the Dallas Cowboys, but um, but yeah, whether it be you're a Cowboys fan too. I, yeah, I grew up. All right. You and I are sitting in the same seat today. So we are sitting in the same yeah, seat. I've been a, a fan a, since '78. Okay, so Starbuck. Danny White, Hollywood, yeah, yeah, yeah. Henderson. All those guys, so yeah. I, yeah. So I'm, I'm with you. Drew Pearson. Uh, yeah, Drew right? Pearson. Come Old on, man. Pierce. We're talking that. Yeah, that thing, you know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm a Cowboys fan. and But, you know, so, so for some, some odd reason, Michigan, Detroit was always just heavy on my radar. So um, I, get in, I get a DM from this young lady. Her name is Lauren Mosier. And she's asking about me coming to her salon to do a men's cutting class. And, of course, I get those requests all the time. People shoot me, hey, I want to take a class from you, and I want to do this. And I'm like, oh, this is bullshit. Like, I, you know, if she's really, really serious, you know, she'll message me back. And um, she did. And I thought, that was, let's go, this is strange. So we were, talking, we we're talking through chat, and she just falls off the face of the earth. Like, literally, like, ghosted me. And I'm like, I knew this was crappy, whatever. <laughs> a year later... I get a message back from her. She's like, hey, sorry, I was off the radar. I was like, oh, shit, I thought you died. <laughs> um, While we were talking. Yeah, I was like, oh, so you know what? She, she does live in Detroit, so, you know, pop, 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 I guess, you know. Um, but from that conversation on, we just became very, very fast friends. And um, I, can, I can honestly say I'm so glad that I waited until I was 40 years old actually to get married. Um, I, I said earlier, uh, you know, I made a lot of good decisions at very bad times. But um, she and I just vibed. She loved hair. I loved hair. She loved education. I loved education. Um, and I guess just the way that the universe worked out, man, um, I sold my school in South Carolina. Um, I did that on a Wednesday. And I drove from South Carolina to Detroit and started um, my career that very next Monday. So, so my wife brought me to Detroit. But I also think that, you know, when you understand your higher purpose and what that means, um, for me, Detroit was, you know, well, to me, it, it still is, but Detroit was the hair mecca of the world. You know, you're thinking about Smokey Robinson and Diana Ross and all the hairstyles and, you know, the dress, the clothing that came out of Detroit. Those were things that actually populated the entire nation with fads and trends. So for me, being in the hair industry, it was good to kind of, shed some light based on my experience and my influences and things that I've done with other companies and, and, and textbook manufacturers to bring that into the city at the time that it was a dying city and GM and Price and the big three were struggling so um, my hope is that some of the good things that I was able to do in the industry um, that they, they still kind of resonated today so, so was it scary I mean you said you had a school was it a barbering school yes was it scary to 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 give that up to go to an area that like a big question mark? You know what it? Um, I think that I think that the level of fear that something like that would be invoked in most people. I didn't feel that because again, I think it was part of my higher purpose. I know that sometimes in order for you to get the way you need to be, you gotta leave some things behind. So um, I, did, I tell my students this all the time, it's sacrifice versus success. What is it that you're willing to give up to get the way you need to be? And we all know being you know, in the industry for as long as we have, most people aren't willing to give up anything. It's very self-absorbed, it's very me, I, me, I, versus thinking about the higher purpose, which is we. We all need to speak, to, we all need to learn to speak a little French right. once in a while. You know, we need to say we, and how are we gonna do things? So um, was, it, was, it, was it scary? Yes. But I also think that being a barber and a licensed barber and a licensed instructor anywhere in the country, I can, I can hold my own, man. That's just faith in my industry, faith in my abilities, but faith in my licensure, man. Like, I can go anywhere and make a living and make it happen. Mm. I, and that's just my, the way I feel about me and, and my skill set. That's amazing. Do you follow um, Mr. Jason Wilson? I do not follow Jason Wilson. And Jason, if you're listening, don't hold that against me. No, 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 no. He's this great guy in Detroit. So, okay. um, he, uh, you know, remember, 
yeah. Jason Wilson. So, uh, Mr. Wilson, I'll give him all of his due respect, but he, um, he opened a dojo in, in Detroit. And he's changing men's lives. Oh wow! You know, I did, I did see, I do see his some of his Instagram stuff yes. and things like that. Yes. Yeah, I don't personally know him, but uh, but you know, everybody from Detroit's a celebrity. Yeah, well, right. sure. <laughs> <laughs> so the shameless plug there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Y'all can't see me, but I'm blushing. I'm turning purple. <laughs> they can uh, see you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> right. No, no, he's just a really good follower. I read, I read a couple of his books. Sure. Um, and uh, he just, I just really like what he's putting out in the world and just about being, you know, good fathers and good men. Absolutely. And, and what that means to the community and how important that is. Um, a lot of it's faith-based. Sure. And, um, but but th- it's faith-based, but the lessons aren't. The lessons That's are like, fair. Yeah, you know, the lessons are, 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 are street lessons. Sure. But it's faith-based um, with the book. But it, anyways, it, it's incredible. He's just, I, I really, I, I'm inspired by him. Sure. You know, and, 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 and by following him. Um, I'm inspired to be a better man, a better human, a better person, a better father. I mean, honestly, as we should be, right? So, you know, one of the things, and and I've been talking to school owners and instructors all across the country, one of the the big things is that we're having to take a lot more time throughout our day in schools to teach soft skills, hello, how are you, good morning, good afternoon, than we are actually teaching the art of barbering. And you guys know just as much as I do, we're not in the hair business, we're in the people business. Your vibe attracts your tribe. Your best ability is availability. I think that through COVID, a lot of those people that are coming or were coming into our industry, a lot of that was lost on them because of the the, the lack of um, the lack of uh, interpersonal relationships and being able to see people and having to converse with other people. So, um, not because it's my school or anything like that, but I think that we're doing a really really good job. We're doing the tough work um, and bringing people into our industry to do understand. Uh, professionalism Mm -hmm. um, and what it really takes to become a successful barber. It's not about the best taper and fades. People, you know, and and, and this is is, uh, Robert Crow means from back in the day, right? People don't remember your haircut. They only remember how how you make them feel. You know, my brother John Mosley always says, you know, we're not selling haircuts, we're selling an emotion. And that is so true. You know, so many times, you know, and you guys know, you get somebody to sit in your chair and they've been stressed out all day long. If you watch their body language and how they sit inside the chair, that'll tell you a lot about what kind of day they had. So we can adjust our mannerisms and what we need to do to make sure that not only we're giving an amazing, um, amazing haircut, but we make sure that we're creating a very bespoke experience based on each and every individual client because everybody's a little bit different, you know? That's awesome, man. So, is that is that with, within your academy? Is that is that kind of what's setting you um, apart? From, yeah, for from sure, for sure. You know, most times people have just your basic curriculum, and you have you know a theory class and a practical class, or whatever the case may be. Um, in our school, we actually have three different classes. Um, my wife and I were very, very innovative in the fact that instead of us just doing one one instructor all day long, we got three instructors that we actually that we actually have in a daytime, and we rotate them in block schedules. If you guys know anything about 21st century learners, our attention well, I said hour because I have to teach them. <laughs> um, but most of the time, the attention span is like the strike of a match, right? But by rotating them, much like they did in high school, every two hours. We've kept attention span. Um, our behavior that we've had around our school with just students kind of wandering the hallways or going out in the back and smoke, that's cut it down. But also from our state board, um, from our state board passing rate, it's actually shot up to 95% because now these students, they, they understand like I only got, you know, how many times have we heard, oh, I don't like my instructor or my instructor doesn't like me. Well, shit, we don't know you that well to even like you. We're here to do a job, right? So what that does is my wife calls it anger mitigation by us switching classes every two hours and each of our instructors getting a new group of students, but also the students getting a new instructor every day or throughout the day, it makes it really, really good. So, But what I wanted to focus on is we have what we call a professional development class. So we have a two-hour block in our day where we only teach problem solving, soft skills, um, taxes, um, how to file properly, um, how to pay back your student loans. Come on, right? Wow. The Department of Education is really, really heavy on schools right now. They look at us as being low value, but it's because of the fact that most people don't even come in with the mindset of paying back their student loans when they go to school, right? So we're, 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 we're doing the best job that we possibly can to lay a very, very strong foundation for our students, not just to come out and be dope 
barbers and barber stylists, but to be good human beings and to have those soft skills and learn how to save, you know, a lot of our students have children. A lot of our students, and I've shared this with a couple other people too, but a lot of our students are in school right now with active LLCs, but without a license. Huh. Hmm. Right? <laughs> so, so, so as a leader in, a, in our industry, my job as a leader is to create more leaders. So I had to really rip down what they thought the barbering looked like and really kind of take a spin back and say, you know what, let's focus on building a better person so that they can build a better barber. You need to have classes with other barber owners and uh, cosmetology, uh, cosmetology school owners. You, you know Tyreek Jackson? I do know Tyreek. Uh, he's a he's a great friend of ours, too. We love Tyreek as well. Coming out of Maryland. Yeah. <laughs> he uh, he's, he does stuff very similar. He's very – he's focused on taking care of those kids to make sure that they get not only to be a good barber, sure. but all the other things that you're teaching as well. Not every school has that mindset. A lot of schools have the mindset, get them in, get them out. Exactly. We need more owners, and and maybe the states need to, to you guys need to kind of create a union <laughs> or something. Um, we can't talk unions right, <laughs> right. now. Y'all know what's going on. Sure. Come on, man. Nah, well, put I, me out there like that. Tony. <laughs> Tony, <laughs> be nice. <laughs> but you guys need to, you know, get together and, 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 and put some, some type of force to – Push I mean, other schools. You remember back in the day, right? We we had a barber union, but you know, I mean, if you think about the, the you think about NAVA right now, right? The North American uh, 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 Barber Boards of America, right? People don't people don't understand the value of those types of relationships. Most people come into into our industry. It's all about sneakers, tattoos, and whatever the latest shiniest clippers. And you don't have people out there outside of myself that show up for those committee hearings and that are talking about some of the things that are plaguing our industry and working literally my ass off every single day to make sure that my students understand, number one, the importance of voting, right? I don't care who you vote for, but you got to vote because those people that you vote for are now going to be the decision makers for what happens in legislature. Those people that you vote for in legislature, your state reps, your state representatives, those are going to be the people that you're going to need to champion your messaging for what you need in order to happen at a state level. And on a state level, I can't really speak to how disappointed I am and some of the people that and that are holding positions on our barber boards all across the country but don't have the grit and the passion and the fight to really push forth the agenda to make sure that our shops are being policed for licensure, that our schools are being policed a little bit more, that everybody who's opening up a barbershop in small municipalities and states, have, they should be getting a barber's license from the state first versus a C of O, right? Think about how, I can't tell you guys how, how this is such a big problem in Detroit metropolitan area. You got people that are opening up barbershops, but the barbershops aren't being inspected by the state. So if a client comes in and something happens, guess what? The, J, the state has no jurisdiction on that shop because it's not a licensed state in the state. It's not a licensed shop in the state of Michigan. So what happens is you get these people who they say, oh, I'm just going to open up a barbershop, right? They're opening up a barbershop. They're hiring, unfortunately, some of my students who don't understand, don't put the cart before the horse, right, to work in these barbershops unlicensed, you know? But I'm not a snitch. I'm an advocate. I don't condone it, but I understand, right? Some of my students don't have jobs. They don't have a way to make money or to support themselves. So as an industry leader and somebody who sat on the AACS board and boards for Barbers International and a number of different things, like it's a very fine line in between knowing what I need to do in order to ensure that our, ins that our industry has some insurance, that people are going to pay taxes, that people are going to pay their student loans back versus, shit, one of my kids is sleeping in this car. He didn't have gas money. You know what I mean? It's, it's, um, it, I'm very, very torn, to be honest with you, gentlemen and, and Lex, um, that, you know, it's not about who's right. It's about what's right. And if I can get enough people to do what's right, then who's right wouldn't even matter. Mm -hmm. Preach, brother. Do you, do, do you, <laughs> and, and we've talked to Tyreek about this, do you think that the non-licensure is a problem that plagues the barber industry more than it does the beauty? Yes. 
Um, and, and again, I, I know that there's some stylists out there that are cutting hair or doing hair without license, but they're not visible. I think that's the biggest difference. Most barbers have such bravado and machismo that we, you know, I'm the best barber in the world. It's, it's so ego driven to where, you know, they all, you almost put yourself out there to get caught, right? It's like a dope dealer. If nobody know you got the product, how is somebody going to know to get a haircut? So you, you find that same mentality coming into the personal appearance industry where it's like everybody wants to have this drug dealer rap, rap city video lifestyle, but nobody's willing to put in the work and get the paperwork to solidify that spot in our industry. Mm. Mm. Y'all got me talking today, I, no, right. and I'm drinking Dasani. <laughs> <laughs> we like we, we like to talk. Yeah, no, I I do too. Well, you know, I'm I'm the son of a of a Baptist minister, so you know, my dad always said, I don't want to make you happy twice. Happy to see me get up to say my sermon, and happy to see my see me sit my ass down. Right. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's keep it moving. Let's keep having fun. You know. What was that like growing up in like a a, a Southern Baptist home? Um, you know what. Uh, I can honestly say that I've learned a lot about discipline, and um, from wrestling and being it, be having to like keep my weight class down, but also being in a household where I think I had the most, the best of both worlds. Number one, I was raised in a house with both my parents, um, both my parents, so that's always a blessing. But the second thing is, my dad was very blue collar, and the fact that he was a truck driver, and my mom being a seasoned educator in the public school system, I got the best of both worlds. I got to see the blue collar work, like my dad coming in smelling like diesel fuel every day, <laughs> you know, um, versus my mom who taught school every day and had to deal with kids, but also had to come home and deal with her own children. So I would like to say that um, growing up in a household like that was kind of, um, it kind of mirrored work life Jenga. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, both parents work, you know, um, but it was pulling that one piece out and sticking it on top just to make sure, like, okay, we can have dinner, nobody's crazy, and we get our homework done. But I think my parents really pride themselves on, you know, growing up in the South, being African American, you know, a lot of those opportunities weren't out there for, for us, you know, mm -hmm. or, or black and brown people. So I think that my, pa my mom and dad conditioned both my sister, my little brother, and I to really look at being educated as one of our top focuses. You know, I always tell my students the difference between rich people and poor people is information. That's it. We're still the same. We still look the same. We still have the same opportunities. But what separates us is information and or lack thereof. Wow. Mm. That's... Yeah, I've I mean, never heard y'all speechless before. What is yeah, going right, on? Yeah. I'm taking it. I'm taking it all in. No, 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 I'm no, absorbing no, it, brother. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I appreciate, appreciate it, man. It, we just got. I think we just got Southern Baptist. Is what, right. what happened? Is, is that oh, I'm, listen, I am going to pass the plate around after this. Right. <laughs> you know, I I always end off. You know, we have morning huddles um, at, at my school at my school, and I always think it's important to kind of set the tone for the day before the day gets sure. started. Let them know what's expected of them. But I always end it off with. All hearts and minds are clear. If nobody else told you guys today, I love you, right? Nobody, think about how many times nobody's ever told you that they love you. But to have someone that's your instructor, I break all the rules when it comes down to that. I hug my students and, you know, I, I'm always making sure that I'm there for them, whether it be for mentally or socially, whatever they got going on. Um, but when's the last time that somebody told you that they loved you? Like genuinely, you know? Right. And I think that's what our industry is missing, man, especially from the future professionals. It's, it's side. not our industry. Yeah. Your story, when you were telling the story, it reminded me of, because you're talking about the South, you know, uh, Rodney Scott's barbecue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, I go there every year. So you didn't go, you didn't go surfing, but you <laughs> went to have barbecue. Right. <laughs> Typical visitor. <laughs> no, no, no. Wait a second. You don't have the whole story, sir. Oh, okay. Well, you know. You don't have the whole story, do sir. Have, do we have to go into executive session? No, like, no, no. <laughs> uh, but. You know, uh, up until COVID, I had a uh, competition barbecue tea, mm. you know, and then, but I saw the Rodney Scott's documentary, right? And, right. I, and it was a father and a son, right? And, and you know, uh, bless uh, Mr. Rodney Scott, you know, he's passed away. For sure, yeah. But his son, he said, growing up, he didn't feel like there was a whole lot of hope. He, he never left. Uh, was it Conway or whatever the air, uh, I forget the, the, the first, because right, right now, Rodney Scott, he has a a uh, Michelin star uh, barbecue joint in, in downtown yeah, Charlotte, right? Yeah. I mean, Charleston. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, he, as growing up, you know, he, he would talk like, you know, he didn't have a whole lot of 
hope. He would look in the sky and see airplanes go by, and he would dream. And uh, his mom would encourage him to, you know, to sure. dream. But his dad always wanted him to t- just take over the family business, just be content, stay where you are. Sure. Uh, you know, and thankful that he listened to his mom, not his dad. You know, then he got out <laughs> yeah. and uh, able to to share his barbecue around the world. And they came amazing? up. Yeah, and, it, and he opened up the restaurant in, in, in Charleston, and it won a mission. I think it's the only Michelin star barbecue, barbecue. rescue. Yeah, for you know? sure. Yeah, so the story was beautiful. So as you're telling the story, I'm just, you know, that's what I'm seeing. That's what I'm hearing, you know what I mean? And it was it, it was the information. His dad said, you know, be content. His mom said, no, go out and, and get it. Yeah. And he went out and got it. But you know what, though, man? Think about it like this. How many times, you know, think about households today, right? I've never once heard what I couldn't do. My parents never said, hey, well, you know what? Uh... You can't do that, you know? When I told my parents that I want to start a barber school, and this is back in 2000, and probably 2002, 2003, they were like, oh my, you know what? That'll be a really good idea, Roderick. I think you should go go ahead and pursue that. And, you know, my mom was like, well, just don't ask us for any money. <laughs> you know? And I was like, all right, bet. That's that's cool. And, of course, you know, I That's I a great come. idea, but don't look for investment. <laughs> well, I mean, I you know, I had to come back because they knew something that I didn't. Think about how many people are told on a daily basis what they can't do. 90, I want to say, I think it's like 85 to 87% of people's daily thinking is negative, right? So if you live in a space where everybody's only telling you what you can't do, how how stifling is that to mm-hmm. our new generation, right? I'm going to pose the question, you guys. We're having a good conversation. Um, one of my favorite speakers is Les Brown. You guys know Love Les. Love Les. Yeah. Um, he had a, his, his, one of his offices inside the Penobscot, Penobscot building inside of Detroit. But he said um, something that was very profound to me. Um, he said, he asked a question. He said, where is the richest place on earth? You guys care to even give it a shot? Where's the richest, richest place, place on earth? Now we're talking financial rich. We're, just, we're, just, we're, talk, we're talking financial rich. Fra- rich financial yes. rich. Yeah. The, the richest place in the world? I would guess it's like here, Qatar okay. or Kuwait. That's fair, but that's wrong. Right. All right. USA? No, no, hold on. Are we talking modern time? We're, we're, ta- we're talking. Or historical? The, modern or historical. Just the richest well, place. Well, there, were, there, were, there was the African king. Okay. There was the African king that was, um, he had like all the gold of, 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 uh, of Africa. Okay. Um, which they also believe might have been Atlantis, but that's a whole mm. other story. But he, um, they said that like he was like, compared the money from then or, you know, his, his wealth from now to then, he would be like a hundred times richer okay. than, um, than Elon Musk. That's fair. Tony, you want to give it a shot? All right. Since um, I would go uh, Babylon. Okay. Uh, L- listen, the richest place on the earth is the graveyard. Think about, <laughs> think about how many times that people have been told what they couldn't do. So all of those dreams and ideas, the innovation, you know where it went? It went in the grave with them too. So I think that as 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 people and as leaders in our industry, we we need, we need to make sure to instill that little little bit of hope in each of our students or, or our people, right? And let's tell them what is possible. Yeah. Let, but also, let's, let's tell them what's possible, let's tell them what's necessary, and let's tell them that it's done. Yeah, and that's what Rodney Scott's mom was doing. Dream. Plant yeah. no seeds. Yeah, dream it. Yeah. You know? Plant those, I, listen, I still color in coloring books, right? I love BMX bikes. I used to be a skater. You know what I mean? I still skateboard every once in a while, you know. Oh, I want to 46, see that video. I, I'll post it for you. Um, my daughter got a new skateboard so um, a couple of years ago, and I was helping her with her trucks and all. She, she was like, I got to get some wheels. That do-. You know, she wanted, like, spinners. Like, she had a 20-inch on, <laughs> on a Benz. And I was like, okay, boo, you know, we'll – I call my little girl boo. Uh, I said, okay, boo, let – you know, so I'm showing her how to adjust her trucks and all of this stuff. And, you know, God bless her, her heart. She's just – She's not a skater, you know what I mean? Right. I, I, you know, I, she's not a skater, to say the least. But I was like, let me show you how to ride this thing. And she was like, you're going to break my skateboard. I said, that's the whole point. Right? <laughs> i got to break the board. I'm supposed to snap it in half. <laughs> when we were kids, they were plastic. So you couldn't even snap them in oh, half. Oh, yeah. You, you, get you, the, you, get Nash, you get the Nash skateboard right. from, from Wally World or something. Yeah. But, uh, oh, but, yeah, man, good old times. Oh, man. That's awesome, man. So cool. I, yeah, when I was going through school, I, w- I wish I had uh, you. <laughs> I, I 
wish I had me, Tony. <laughs> they, I, I messed up a lot of people's right. money, bro. <laughs> All right. So what does it take to uh, to get nominated to uh, for Naha as an educator? Like, do you need to be nominated, or do you put yourself in like like you would like, you know, like what am I looking for? Like just the the imagery like, stuff. Yeah. Is so, the same kind of stuff. So it's two different ways you can actually get nominated. Um, luckily, I got a nomination from someone else. So um, I think that I'm a great person. I just I, I I don't have that type of machismo to nominate myself or anything like I, mm -hmm. it just doesn't feel real it doesn't feel authentic like oh yeah i won and by the way i did this for myself right, right? it's it's it's, it's kind of self-serving well, if anyone's listening i think our podcast is pretty educational like we would love to be put in for a naha yeah for yeah. sure <laughs> and, and, and you know what i think that'll be a first too that i don't think there's ever been like an organization or you know more than one individual that's been nominated for it so um you have to get three letters letters of recommendation um, you have to have a video clip of you actually teaching and a still photo of you teaching. Um, Why the still photo? Um, Why is that for, relevant? They need it for marketing. Right. They need it for marketing. They need, they need it for optics, you know what I'm saying, to, to paint the entire picture so it would be clear to people. But um, luckily I have some, you know, I, I mean, these guys are all right, I guess. I got a, I got a letter of recommendation from Sam Via. <laughs> He's <man>. decent. Um, <laughs> guess I'll keep him around, you know. <laughs> Sam, hey, what's up, baby? Sam what's going man. on? Um, I got a letter of recommendation from Kevin Cameron from Pivot Point. Uh -huh. um, you guys may or may not know, but I was one of the contributors on the newly uh, formed uh, Fundamentals of Barbering, the textbook that just came out. Oh, awesome. Um, I've actually been working. Congrats. Uh, thank you. Um, it's a couple of years old, but I actually did a lot of the video shoots for it, but I checked the curriculum and the content for 21st century relevant. So, mm -hmm. um that was a it took about a it's about a two year process, but you know thinking thinking about thinking back at it like I'm somebody who doesn't even have a college degree, right? But I'm actually I'm actually you're asked a published as a, educator, a subject matter expert, as Kevin Cameron so eloquently put it. You right. know he, he's Canadian, so he's super nice when he says he's Roderick. You do realize you're a subject matter expert now. I said, oh shit, I didn't. I didn't even know, <laughs> didn't even know that was a title. Yeah, I, I, like it's just three syllables. That's all it is, and I can just put this on my Instagram bio. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but yeah, I'm, I've worked with my lady in the past as well um, as a contributor. So, you know, just, man, ne again, never being told what I couldn't do. H how many college failures do you notice out there that's helping to write industry textbooks? Right. Right. So if I can do it, somebody else can do it too. But I think that that's my... That's my thing right now, being in the industry for so long. I want to help to build other young barbers that want to become great presenters, that want to become platform artists, that want to be connected and aligned with, you know, companies, if that's what your jam is or whatever the case would be. I want to show them how to do, how to do that. So, um, Naha 2023, um, I was chosen as a finalist and had some really, really good competition this year. But I think that one of the things that kind of set me apart from a lot of other people is that I really am a teacher. Like, this morning I'm all mad because I sent two students to the board this morning, right? And I'm waiting on their test results to come back like, did he pass his theory? What about practical? Like, I'm, I'm talking to my other instructors in this big right. group chat, but, but I'm a teacher's teacher, right? Like, I'm not one of those school owners that don't come to work every day. I come to work every day. I think it's important for my students to see that I'm not asking them to do things that I'm myself personally, I'm not willing to do. So when we talk about lead by example, you, you really got to lead by example because your students are watching every single, single, single thing that you do. Sure. But, um, but yeah, Educator of the Year, it was great. And... Luckily, um, those two recommendations got me that finalist stamp and was able to kind of take it to the next level and win the 2023, you know, North American Hair Styling Award Educator of the Year, man. Congratulations. Thank man. you. That, that's, yeah. that's pretty awesome. I mean, I mean, beyond pretty awesome. I don't have words for it, but that, that, that's really, really great. Me either, man. I just, you know, it's, it, it's just about living in your purpose, man, to be honest with you. Like, I never sought out to say, you know, I wanted to be a famous barber or I wanted to be this, you know, published author in this text and man I, w I wanted to coach high school wrestling you know what i'm saying and have and have summers off but you know you, they always say that if you want to make the universe laugh then make plans and you know my plans didn't work out for me but they worked out for me yeah mm. my plans didn't work out for me but they worked out for me but they worked out for me should we quote that should that yeah, be a hashtag that, should, that might be the title of the, of the, of the podcast right <laughs> yeah, if things don't work go to the south right. <laughs> <laughs> 
get you some barbecue, all right, yeah. and, and become a Michelin five-star restaurant. That's it. Right. Only in the South. <laughs> well, you know what it is? It's like that old Chinese proverb about, um, what's the take? We'll, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll see. Is it good? We'll see. Yeah. Is it bad? As long, you know we'll what? See. As long as nobody's saying, I'll try. You know, if you ever needed a ride from work and someone's like, yeah, I'll try, you can't count on that, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. see. That that's, that's gives you a 50%. It's a shake of the dice, man. Seven or 11 for sure. Right. Although my daughter would say whenever I said, we'll see, that's a no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a mine, too. Know. Is your daughter named Addison as well? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, she's named Boo. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's, it's funny how you get so many things in common. The commonality that I have with oh. other hair professionals is just awesome. Um, but yeah, my daughter would tell you the same thing. She's like, um, I really need to get this order from Sheen and you know, I got homecoming coming up and I was like, Oh girl, we'll see. She goes to my wife and next thing I know is a package coming in the mail. So yeah. it is what it is. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Awesome, man. That's awesome, man. Thank you, man. You're, you're so inspiring, man. I, I like we need we need more Roger time, man. That's what I yeah. I know. We gotta have part two. Yeah. yeah I think so. You just just don't confuse it with just don't confuse it with demon time, which right. is what's going on around my school now. You know, Halloween's coming. It's like, oh, oh, man, Mr. Sam's, you on demon time. I was right. like, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want anything and, to do with that. And is my Southern Baptist heritage <laughs> going to oust me from the church? Right. <laughs> well, we'll have his wife on. And then oh, we'll my get gosh. The, She's and, amazing. And then we'll get them both on together oh, yeah, and no, say, no, hey, no, look. No, no. <laughs> no, no. Listen. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Happy wife, happy life. I, yeah, yeah, happy house, happy spouse. I'm not. You got to interview her on your own. No, no, we're gonna do that. And then, then we're gonna bring. Yeah, that's what we're gonna bring do. Bring us that's back the for. Point. Yeah. Uh, 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 <laughs> that's what Roderick said. Hey, this is what. She when, yeah. what is it? Uh, a love is blind reunion. Bring yeah. us back for the reunion show. Ooh, yeah. So we can. Thought. Yeah. So we can. You know, share. You know, put put all the pieces together for the stories and everything. But that's yeah, man, great. this has been great. Roderick, uh, what are you grateful for? Oh man. Now you, you, you want to hit me with the real questions now. You know what, man? I think as of lately, um, come, you know, I just turned 46 years, years young. I think, honestly, I'm grateful for just being my authentic self. So many people make an effort and they try really, really hard to be something that they're not. And it comes off as being really, really sketchy. And you can you can tell those people who aren't being genuine and honest whether they be. But do you think that they know that they're not being genuine and oh, honest? A thousand percent. Or do you think that? It's, or do you think it's just part of the process of finding out who you are? I think because that because because I can say, and and I'll probably speak for you too, but okay. I can tell you that at 30 years old, I thought I was being authentic to myself, but I didn't know who myself was enough to be authentic. You know, I think that's fair. Um, being a serial entrepreneur. I think I've had to learn some of those lessons very, very early on mm -hmm. in my life, not necessarily in my career, where, you know, when I would go into a bank having, you know, a $300 credit score and asking these people for $50,000, that takes a, <laughs> takes, takes a little bit of, you know, say it with your chest, as Kevin Hart <laughs> so eloquently put it, you know? But I think that by, by me being my authentic self, but just being vulnerable with people, I think my authentic self came with the vulnerability to tell sure. people what I was really good at, but also to share with them what I wasn't really good at. Weakness is not when you can explain to somebody when you want, when, and you can ask them for help. Weakness is asking or not asking for help, knowing that you need it. So learning about myself earlier and who my authentic self is, I think that's what really kind of pushed me. My kids will tell you the same thing. My students are like, is he like this at home? And he was like, oh, my God, he's worse. <laughs> <laughs> he's more authentic at home. Yeah, my son, my son came home, and I was like, yo, man, you smelling good. Like, what you got on? He's like, I got a date. And I was like, oh, shit, you got a date. I was like, what's her name? Let me see her picture. What's her Snapchat? Right. You know what I'm saying? And he was like, you don't need to know all of those things. <laughs> I'm like, I ain't doing no deep dive on her. I just want to make sure. And turn your life 360 on, too. Right. If she's from, if she's from oh, the yeah. city, I need to make sure you know I know where you at. Right. That's right. Not everybody in the city. A safe son, okay. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's just right. finding my authentic self. I think that's we, my biggest thing. Man. And, and on that, you know, actually, what what the beauty of your forties and fifties are are that. Yeah, for but, sure. You know, for sure. And 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 a couple of years ago, we were um, we were honored enough to go to Hair Love Retreat. Um, oh with, yeah, with Elizabeth Fay. Yeah, love Elizabeth. And we love her. 
right? So we were there for a week, and, and we were have that conversation as we were walking up, like, on the last day. And just, like, I'm so glad that we've branded ourselves as us. For sure. And, like, our, in our true self. Right. Because we couldn't have been there for a week and kept up the facade. One, the energy is crazy, you know, but, but it we... It takes stamina, right? It takes it stamina. Takes su- it takes super, like, superman strength sam- stamina to be able to keep and operate at that... This not really who I am level, right. you know, yep, and sure. you're drained at the end of the day from making an effort to appease people who don't even really care about there, there, who you are and what you do. There's that. I mean, but I also have empathy for those people that are trying to find their way because, I mean, you see it. Oh, for sure. But, but I see. But now at this stage in my life, I see it with empathy. That's the going dad like, in you. That's yeah. the dad in me. Yeah. Like, you see the empathy and you're like. Do you have okay. a daughter? I Yeah, I have a daughter. Okay. Does yes. she, is she? Is she? Are you wrapped around the finger? Oh, of course. Yeah. I yeah. think I learned a lot a lot about myself from my daughter. You know, she is, her mindset, her pettiness, like her just willingness to do whatever it takes. I, I'm going to say she gets it from me. You know what I'm saying? Her, her mom's pretty pretty dope, too. But, uh-huh. um, but we're kind of the same people. But having a young lady who now I have to emulate who she should be looking for in a partner. Not only did that help to solidify my relationship with her, but also it makes me very aware of my interactions with my wife as well and how we show love towards our, our kids because I don't ever want my children to think that we have a toxic relationship. You know, I want them to see what real love looks like. So my hopes are that they can emulate that later on. Which yeah, even more important, even more girl, important for your daughter is for your son. Yeah, well, it's important yeah. for your son to see how to love. You know what? You know, fathers, we spoil our daughters and raise our sons. Yep. Mothers, they spoil their sons and raise their daughters. Yep. So having a guy and a girl and my wife and myself, mm-hmm. I think just that whole mix of how we conduct each other and show each other love, I think it gives us a little bit more balance when it comes to all of those things. My, uh, so my, I have a daughter and a son as well. My okay. daughter's older than my son. Um, but, um, and I agree with you 100%. When I tell my wife, and I said this on the podcast, I said, I tell my wife all the time, you know, I'm thankful for Skyla because she taught me how to love you unconditionally. Isn't that crazy? I didn't knew, know what true unconditional love until I had my daughter. When she was born, she taught me how to love that deep, and I was able to transfer that to my wife. Sure. You know, and then my daughter got married uh, to her college sweetheart, and he came to me and asked, for my daughter's hand in marriage. You know what, can I say something real quick? Yep. I think that's still very amazing. My father-in-law laughed at me, you know, because I'm from the South, right? It's like, hey, Mr. Dennis, you know, I love your wife. I love Lauren. You know, may I have her hand in marriage? He's well, like, your daughter. You said your wife. Oh, well, well <laughs> speaking into existence, <laughs> yeah. right? Remember, don't tell somebody what they can't do, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, may I have your, your daughter's hand in marriage? He's like, Roderick, if you don't get out my face, <laughs> you have lifted a weight off of my shoulder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can have but, her. Fly, <laughs> <little> pelican. <laughs> right. <laughs> but when he asked me that, I said, you got to promise me a couple of things. Okay. I said, one, Try to love her as much as I love her. Sure. And I said, two, always put her needs before your own as she should. She put your needs before her own. If you guys did that, this, this marriage will last a lifetime. How long have they been married? Uh, they got married five about four, years, four years ago. Four or five years ago, uh, and I'm expecting grandbaby number three. Look at you. Congratulations. You know? <laughs> That's yeah. dope. Yeah. yeah, five years. They've been married for five years, and uh, – and I couldn't ask for a better son-in-law. You know, I think the, 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 there's a there's a slight difference in in my experience with kids is because I came into my kids' life when they were very very young. So um, my my daughter at the time when I started raising her was six years old and my son was nine. And I even though they're not mine biologically, I still I don't ever want them to feel like there's a disconnect by me calling them my stepchildren or whatever the case may be. Um, my dad's 74. He, he made a little funny comment. He said, well, I'll tell you this. If you feed them long enough, they'll start to look like you. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, my son, I said, Daddy, you know what Parker is? Your dad's is? funny. He is funny. He's, <laughs> this is where I get it from. I said, you know what? I said, you know, Parker, I'm having a really, really challenging time with him looking like me. I said, every time he goes outside, his freckles come out, and every time I come outside, I just start to look like a California raisin. So, um, yeah, but yeah. But I was raised by, well, 
my stepdad died when I was 10, but he was my that. dad. Sure. You Absolutely. Know what I, mean? mm-hmm. I didn't, he was no, nothing but my dad. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I can relate to that. Yeah. My kids, they refer to me as dad, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And, you know, just, I'm, I'm just blessed to have them both in my life. They slowed me down so much, but it also gave me something to work towards because, you know, I think the idea is dads and parents is you want your kids to have a better life than you had. And I know that it's a little bit more expensive than when my dad had to buy me a Tonka <laughs> truck. You know, my kids are like, can I get a car? I'm like, you're 13. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, and, and, I'm, and then they go, well, cars are going to go way up in the next three years. You need to act fast. I'm like, hey, who's on the sales end of this thing, huh? I'm the one working for the companies, not you. Y'all work for Team Mom. Yeah. I tell you what, this has got to be the quickest hour. Dude, it's gone. It's gone. I mean, so can I, can I ask you guys? Just you can one, whatever one question. you do, do. This is your podcast, oh, brother. All yeah, right. Yeah. So you can ask just ten questions. So I, I'm as an educator, I'm always looking to get better. So can I ask you both three things you liked about our podcast today, and one thing you would do different? Uh, Corey, you can start, man. I, 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 I always do. <laughs> I saw um, Tony just lean back, like, oh shit. Right, yeah. <laughs> damn, damn. Um, three things you like. One thing you would do different. One thing I like about the podcast. So it, we have to build a positivity sandwich. So it has to yeah. be three things you like, okay. and then one thing you would do different. Three things that I like. Uh, the authenticity. Thank you. The laughter. Um, I also, and I wasn't going to bring it up because, you know, we're kind of dialing down, but, but I have so much respect for a man that steps into another man's shoes and man. owns it as his own. Can I, can I give you a, a, a virtual hug? Because... Not that I'm looking for accolades, and I'm not that I'm looking for somebody who's like Roderick's a great dad, but you know what? From from man to man, that's it. It feels really, really good. It does take a very special person to raise and love kids as their own, um, but not take away from their biological father too, right? You no, know, no, it's not taking away from self. Yeah, I'm blessed that he gave me the opportunity to be mm. in their lives. Sometimes we don't look at things as a blessing, but if you if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at will change. For me, it wasn't me looking like, man, I'm raising another guy's child. It's like, you know what? The universe has given me exactly what I need to fulfill my higher purpose in my life, and that was two children. Well, you know what? He should be commended, too, because, you know. Um, uh, we can't do that. My wife will well, not allow Well, those I will do it. I will do it. Because, because on the same note that, like, he gave that permission but had to turn his ego off. But 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 he's got two kids that have to be better humans sure. down the road. And and like if, if there if there's a if there's a good man also in their life, for sure. That's just more education and that's more opportunity for them to the be great. Right? The knowledge. Exactly. And th- but, but but on a serious note, thank you for saying that, man. This is the first time that everybody's ever given me those flowers on a podcast. So y'all are doing it right. Well, listen, man. I mean, we we try to be as real as possible, but not real. Like I'm being real. Like sure. But like like I think that I think what's lacking in men to men relationships is that Sam Villa would say heart to heart. Yeah, for sure. Yep, for you sure. Know? I love so, that. Um, what would you do different? What would I do different? I don't know. I you see. I don't. I, I don't. I, I don't. I don't know if I believe in in, in different in our conversation. Certainly okay, not this fair. conversation today. Because can I start with that? Yeah, let me finish up Fine, my thought, and then you can, then right. you can start with All that. Right. You, can fa- you can do this, this, the, the sandwich, but but <laughs> but because I think that everybody, every conversation is unique and sacred. Sure. You know, so I don't, I don't. There's nothing in there that I'm like, well, I wish I didn't. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't see the world that way. So, you know, not for the most part. I mean, there's definitely times where I'm like, well, that was ugly. Right. But there was nothing ugly today. Awkward. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, all right, Tony, All right. what you got, brother? What well, I would. Well, here's start what's wrong. We oh. didn't do it earlier. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I would like the one thing I would change. Do different. Do different. I would have gone first. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) That's your friend, bro. He's right there. (laughs) But if you can't throw your friends under the bus, Robert, who can you do? No, meaning like, because like the the dad thing he stole. uh, (laughs) (laughs) I'm raising his kids. Just taking his material (laughs) to Because as you were were talking about your kids, it, it was making me think about my dad. You know what I mean? And how grateful that I was that he stepped in. For sure. Because otherwise, I, I wouldn't have had any male figures in my life. Yeah. And the one male figure that was in my life, he knows, uh, was not a positive. Sure. You know? Um, this, uh, so I'll go back. Now let's go through the th- things that, it, yeah, that I really you liked. I liked about the podcast is is really getting on that deep level with you. And, and, and just, it really feels like we're friends. 
Yes. You know what I mean? And, and not just we're interviewing you. That's the Southerner, though, right? I yeah. Think, I think the, the idea is to always make people feel like they're at home and they have friends. I disagree. Yeah. <laughs> it's just no, 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 I don't think it's a Southern thing. I, I think that I think that we're of we're of kinder spirits to where you know where where I think it's our responsibility as men to prepare more men to be men and not in kind of like a, a, a ego thing, but on the other side of ego. Can I give you some snaps for that, brother? I love that. That's very. You brought it back. You brought it back. Second thing is that uh, we both enjoy the South. That that <laughs> Southern, uh, you know. Rodney you Scott's barbecue. You do not surf, sir. <laughs> <laughs> or skateboard. You for that. Right. Yeah. But Came the barbecue's for our swine and the, our beef. But that's where barbecue started. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll give you that one. And the third <laughs> is how we agreed earlier in the beginning of the podcast that if Barry Sanders would have had a Troy Aikman, a Michael Irvin, a Daryl Johnson, no. imagine if he had three or four other uh was it, what's the word? Uh, Hall of Famers on his lineup. You know what, what he could have done. Can I get some Barry, with that wine, bro? Barry Sanders would have had. I don't think any running back in history would have been able to. Listen, to listen. Here's, the, here's the difference. Is Emmett had holes. Barry found holes. Good difference. Yeah. Yeah. Good and like that dude was like. They were all different types of runners. Yeah. They had different running styles. I remember when he retired. But he had. But Emmett did have four other Hall of Famers. No, the bro. The hate is just so <laughs> heavy. Oh my gosh! Come on. You, on that, that note, you know, you know what? Let's get, let's go back. Let's throw it back to you. What, okay. what were the three things that, that that you liked, and what what would have you, and what was the one thing that you would change? Uh, you know, I don't like when people throw questions back at me, but I will oblige. Well, for wait, sure. wait, it's our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you said it was mine. It's his no. podcast. It's our it podcast. Is. You're okay. out. Right. You're out. Right. It's our podcast. Um, you're out. Three things that I liked. Um, I like the fact that I think that as we continue to grow older as men, like you said before, mm -hmm. these conversations on podcasts, especially industry driven podcasts, are not happening. Um, I like the fact that you reached out to me on Instagram. That was very, very easy. Um, to, to, to translate like what you needed from me and just to show up. Um, I like the fact that I got to meet a lot of new people. Um, I think that um, I think that relationships really, really help our industry to grow um, and to get the glow up. And I think the only thing that I would do different is um, I would set this up at a bar and we would have a couple of nice little IPAs or something like that to really soften up this conversation a little bit. I, you know, um, I'm a hugger. And at some point, I'm, I'm a crier, too. So um, I like the Same. fact that I can be vulnerable and emote, which is something that a lot of men, especially our age, we weren't, we weren't brought up to, to be able to have feelings. You know, that made us weak and that made us soft. And um, I just like getting older um, and being around people in my, in my age range as well. We all are 36. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that we can share those moments and how. If we're that, 36, that makes Alex the old one at the table. So um, last, last little juncture about being in the South, there's a couple things you, don't, you never ask a woman. Um, her age, her shoe size, and her dress size. So, Alex, I did her age, her shoe size, or her dress size. You never ask a what woman. What about her ring size? If, if her bank account looks right. Um, so <laughs> if your bank account that, looks right. Uh, no, rom <laughs> romance with no finance is a nuisance. <laughs> Y'all will get that next week. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Roderick, man, you are just a delight. Um, Thank you. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm sure moving forward we can call you a friend, and I yeah, can't absolutely. wait to see you. Um, on the road, you know, we're on the road a lot. I know yeah. you're on the road a lot. We see you out there. Um, and, and I'm going to do a little last second shout out to Miss Nikki Lee because she was the Love one that Nikki. she was the one that actually introduced us um, during during the during the times, not yeah. before the times or after yeah. the times, but during the times we were we were um, able to sit on a lot of um, uh, phone calls together. And, nice. and, you know, anyways, all that. Thank you, Nikki Lee. Thank you for the introduction yes. and put you in, putting you in our sights. Um, we appreciate you. Thank you guys for having me. Much love, Absolutely. Brother. Yeah, if you guys need to find me, I'm love. on Instagram at Roderick Samuels. That's R-O-D-R-I-C-K-S-A-M-U-E-L-S. -E and for my beauty and barber school instructors out there, um, you want to follow me at Teaching Barbers is my jam on Instagram. No, that's yeah. a good one. Thank you. Um, I give little tips and tricks about how I structure my day, whether it be on a clinic floor or in a classroom, just so to, to keep those instructors who aren't getting paid a lot of money and who don't see that light at the end of the tunnel 
Um, I promise you all it's not a train. So follow me at, at Teaching Barbers is my jam as well. I love that. Love, I love the title. Mr. Roderick Samuels, thank you very, very much for hanging out with us. And thank you for joining us on Yo. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating, and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hair Distry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.